anthropologists began with this notion of culture, that people's lives were patterned, that, that those patterns were learned, and that we ourselves could learn those other patterns, or at least do participant observation with them by doing this process of ethnographic fieldwork. We talked about culture, and we talked about language, and then in this part of class, we're basically going to be concentrating on what anthropology has done in the last hundred years or so in terms of looking at other people's patterns, turning that angle back upon ourselves, and trying to understand what those say about others and about ourselves. As I said before, they anthropology went out into a world that had been structured basically by European and North American colonialism so that others, the beliefs of others were subordinated quite physically in some cases uh, to those of the European and North American colonizers. Anthropologists were not necessarily great people, they were participating in this whole scheme. And so we saw the anthropologist Mary Douglas, the very famous anthropologist Mary Douglas say that what Evans Pritchard did by studying the belief systems of an African people, the Azande, and taking them seriously and philosophically was revolutionary. Now, sure, that was revolutionary in Europe, but should they have been that way in the first place? Should they have been so racist and prejudiced to believe that way to start with, that is uh, perhaps a, an important issue to think about uh, as we think about what anthropology did. So we don't wanna turn anthropologists into the heroes here. They were participating in this system. In today's class, we're going to concentrate on religion and rituals. For Tuesday, we'll turn our attention to economics and subsistence and so on down the line as we finished out the syllabus. In many anthropology courses, and even in my own, at this point, I would go into lots and lots of different facts about different religions, and we'd talk about shamanism, and we'd talk about these beliefs, and we'd talk about so many things. In this class, we're not going to do that as much. We're going to concentrate on two or three main points or perspectives that I think anthropology can be helpful for or useful to you. We'll be illustrating them with some facts and some details, but I really basically want you to get some main points out of this. I'm not interested in crushing you with information, especially at this stage of our, of our lives as the spring sunshine begins and final exams bloom. So one of the first tactics that anthropologists used in this going out and looking at other people was something that we called making the strange familiar. So going out to a place where people might have thought that, oh, these people are have irrational or strange or superstitious ideas and trying to figure out what was the logic behind these ideas. Could they be related to our own? And uh, one of the unfortunate things about using the auto-generated subtitles here is that on the uh, Strange Beliefs film is that they kept using different weird words to describe the Azande, like Zen and Sandy and other strange things. But uh, Evans Pritchard was one of the first anthropologists to do this among the Azande. And he came up with an example, or one of his examples I'd like to talk about a little bit more, which was that of the granary. So these granaries were held up by wooden posts, and they'd be get eaten out by termites over time, and then they'd fall every so often. But sometimes people would be sitting under a granary and they'd get hurt. And uh, people would say, well, that was because of, of what they, they would call what we have translated anthropologically as witchcraft, it has very little to do with what people in today's world think of as witchcraft. It's actually a, a concept which more relates to this sort of spiritual energy that somehow something had happened, let's say, to the person sitting under the granary where witchcraft had 
cause the person to get hurt. And Evans Pritchard, of course, said, well, wait a second. No, the termites ate the post. Can't you see? That, of course, has caused the granary to fall. And they said, well, of course we know that the termites eat the posts. We know cause and effect here. But why was that person sitting under the tree? Or, I mean, under the granary. Why was he hurt? Why wasn't it 20 minutes later when somebody else or nobody was under it? That part of it, the why, the bigger question, that's where this belief comes into play. And we can think about that in our own lives, perhaps over the last couple of years, we've been very concerned about the transmission of illness. You may have gone to a party where some people get it and some people don't. And we wonder why some people get sick and some people don't. And we can do the odds, we can do the science, we can do the probabilities, but sort of something nags at us, right? Why, why did this happen to this person, when? And those are the questions that in some ways religious beliefs seek to answer. Those beliefs that in some ways science, we say we believe in science and we say we believe in cause and effect, but it doesn't necessarily give us that, you know, I guess it was bad luck. I mean, fate, those kinds of things. And in, in a Zandi belief, that would be a something that was transmitted via witchcraft. So what Evan Fisher discovers is that from that part, that point of departure, the beliefs are, are perfectly logical and form a coherent system. And as he says at the end, he, he can't himself do things without consulting oracles. And if you start to do that and you start to, to act as if you believe, then you end up believing as if you act or in the way that you act. So very interesting and important person in anthropology who really took these ideas seriously at a level that other people had not up until that time. The other side of this is to take what is, so one big point is to go out and think about the strange and to bring it into our orbit as the logical and the familiar. And then the other approach is to make the familiar strange, to take something that we think we know in our own society and to look at it from a different angle. We've seen this back, back at the very beginning with the body ritual among the Naki Rama, where we take our own rituals and look at them through the standpoint of somebody from far away. But uh, this article by George Gmelch, Bates, Baseball Magic, is kind of a classic approach to the subject in which he takes something, the, the all-American sport of baseball, and all of a sudden he's talking about fetishes and taboos and rituals. So, actually, Jack, start us off. A true baseball player. You said it all made sense. <laughs> How about the bats touching each other? That was actually my most interesting part. Why can't the, are the bats, are they not supposed to touch each other? Baseball bats, that is. Um, I, don't, I never like, when it said in the article, it said like the bats, like, um, I never thought that that was like. Don't want to touch anybody else, but it might not have been clearly articulated that your energy might seep into their bat. Or you said that sometimes you use their bats to get back on the track. Yeah, so we have this kind of, uh, uh, some people, uh, some people thought it was, it was completely uh, like what they did. Let's see, there were a couple of soccer players here who also talked about similar things. Juliana, soccer. Like, kind of? Yeah, I just said the idea that the specific animal form of music is why they were like, they could really like do that. Like, I don't know if it makes sense, really, because it kind of like it's not a class. The good luck chant. All right. Nicole, also soccer. Yeah. <laughs> I just like to take someone to highlight the things that they like. Thank you. The soccer players. And there were a number of people who didn't give me a sport. Leah, what's your sport? 
Ah, field hockey. What do you do? There's just What's your sport? Oh, no, that was Leah. Julie, what's your sport? <laughs> also field hockey. Same thing? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have my hockey position, but I pre-game The pre-game. You talked about the team stuff. Yeah. Let's see. We had some other people who didn't tell me their sport. Tyler, sport. Uh, Lacrosse. What's it like? Oh, yeah, I just took the uh, whole child. All right. The old cold shower routine. Mm. Evan, sport. Lacrosse. Lacrosse, too. Cold showers? No, I don't do cold showers, but I have my own routine for more often. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to. Got to, got to have your routine. Let's see. Wait a second. Who else? Kyle. Same socks, but washed. <laughs> I was very concerned. Till I got the bad part. All right, same, let's see. We had some, some different sports here. We had a couple, base, we had a couple other baseball people. Mickey, you were baseball. Luke, you were baseball. So, I think that baseball, I guess I, I was starting to think about why is baseball like, like when, when Jack said everything made sense and others of you who play different sports were like, eh, sort of, but not as severe as baseball. And I started to think about how weird baseball is or like why, it, what it might be about baseball that makes it more superstitious. So I guess, I don't know, you tell me. What's different about baseball than these other sports? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they play more games, lots of games, a lot more games, playing all the time. Huh, okay, so that's interesting, just the number of games played, uh, Kanye. I'm not a baseball player, but I feel like... Neither am I. We're just speculating here, <laughs> yeah. There's so much waiting in baseball. It's so boring. Baseball takes so long, and most of the time you're not doing anything. I mean, there must be, yeah, your mind must be going crazy, right? Yeah, Mickey. Um, like, at least on the offense, it's very, like, intense self reliance on, like, that one person. Like, it's not like you're just hitting. It's just one person. It's one person at one time. And what strikes me is, Again, I'm not a baseball person, but it has to be one of the few sports in which you score points when you don't have the ball. You know what I mean? Like someone's throwing a ball at you and you have to do something, but you don't have control of the ball. I'm thinking of all these other sports, soccer, you got control of the ball, basketball, football. <sighs> I'm trying to think of some other sport where you don't have control. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> if you got that much control, well, that's one of the, 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things about the article. He says that, you know, where these rituals and the beliefs really come in are not in the fielding because everybody knows that they can field. It's in that pitching and hitting thing because it's so, it seems so, you know, I mean, yeah, I know if you're good, you can place the ball at different places, but, you know, it's tough. And you really don't, I guess I would say you don't have, you know, you're not, you're not, passing the ball around like you know you're not able to do the whole uh i know you're throwing to each other but you don't really you're not you're not up against somebody dribbling a ball anyway i guess i i think that the, i think that baseball is is uniquely lends itself to these kinds of things i think um i'm trying to think of another sport i think cricket cricket it, but that's kind of like a a cousin right a cousin of baseball that's probably why the why they're so weird in the British Empire, the baseball cricket thing. All right, so some of you though took this into areas of life that were not necessarily baseball or sports. Kanye, where else? I mean, to me, I always have to be like in such a bad state before I perform. Like I have to call the audience to the stage where I feel like if I don't, then that's not a legitimate performance. I guess it's like a so the backstage things before you perform and of course you know that there's all kinds of things that people do and did to overcome stage fright and though you know i mean that's a serious serious issue for performers so yeah anaya you took it into the world of exam taking So the good luck coin. And it does strike me that, uh, you know, taking an exam is kind of like doing a sport. You don't know what they're going to throw at you, man. You're trying to score some points and somebody's throwing a curveball at you. You need some good luck charms to get through that stuff, right? So, yeah, it's interesting that this gets put into, into the class. Nick, into class. Well, I think I've mentioned, like, uh, the seats we sit in. Like, we're not... Um holding so it's like we have to sit in a certain seat every day yet like we choose like the first day where we sit and day after day maybe the first few days is a new way but like say if i tomorrow sat there maybe it wouldn't be too jarring but you know people might notice and it's like a uh, it's like an off-putting thing but throw me one seat change and I'm in trouble. I got your whole seat chart right here. I didn't even tell you where to sit and I know it every day. Exactly where you are. Sometimes I repeat your names, but uh, let's see. Oh, Jake, you were in kind of an everyday life person too. Where else do we see these kinds of things? Yeah, so people, you know, I mean, and I know this term has been a little bit overused. We don't want to, I mean, there, there's, you know, there's a serious uh, condition that people have that, but I think it relates to in general, there are ways in which we try to make the random flow of life. Like we talked about, why am I sitting under this post when it fell? Or why did this happen to me? We try to make it explainable or we try to do things to, to control things that may seem to be out of our control. Now, Allison, you said that this article was not relatable at all. Why? Fair enough. You know, there's a wide range of variation in any society. Some people may not like this stuff at all. Why do you think that is about you, though? I have an idea. What's your, what's, what's your major here? What do you go try to convince students to, to do here at Hartwick, those admitted students working for admissions that day? Were you there? The admitted students' day. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, uh, my 
Because he's a very senior. You're a senior. Why'd they want you to recruit recruit for? Some people. You can talk to people. Grad school in what? Uh, pharmaceutical sciences. Aha, chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. You presented a conference. Yay, all good stuff. Congratulations. I guess it strikes me that, you know, the more sciencey you want to be, <laughs> the less you want to relate to this stuff. You don't want to say, hey, I'm a chemistry major, but you know what? I need to have my lucky charm when I go into lab, else the, the stuff isn't going to fizz right or something. I don't know. That's my, that's my theory that some people, you know, we don't, we, don't want to, we don't want to have these things. All right, we'll stop picking on Allison. Um, so strange, familiar. Familiar, strange. I want to also introduce an idea that uh, has come up in anthropology. Uh, it was in some ways first proposed a hundred and something years ago by uh, the Dutch anthropologist Arnold van Gennep uh, in a book called The Rites of Passage. And what van Gennep did is he looked around the world at these rituals or these things that we do to transform from one life stage to another. Let's see, what life stage? How about when you get married? So when you get married, you start off, you're not married, you're single, and then you have a ritual, and then you become a married person. It's a rite of passage because there's a ritual that's involved and you pass from one social state to another social state. And what Arnold Van Gennep said is that in almost all societies, there are these things that people become adults from being uh, adolescents or children, uh, that there are these stages of life. And that in almost all cases, these rituals are characterized by three phases. The first one being of separation. So in the case of being, of, of getting married, the bride and groom get isolated from their group. They have to put on special clothes. You're not supposed to see the clothes of the other person. You get all separated and you get placed into a special state of separation from the normal group. Then there's this period of transition, which might be the ceremony or the ritual itself in which certain things are uttered and some sort of religious officiant says this and that and does some mumbo jumbo and they make vows to each other. And then they say, you may kiss each other. And the person says, and I present to you so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so, and they walk out in their new roles and you get re-aggregated into society. So now you come back in as regular people, except you're different people because now you're married. So uh, what he said is that, you know, if we look at kind of uh, uh, um, trying to think of other things like uh, bar mitzvahs when people transition from one one state to another um, that in some ways we go through we often go through these processes. The anthropologist Victor Turner elaborated on this um, a bit. He said that the transition period, that ritual period is often one of what he called liminality a time in which people are neither here nor there, sort of between threshold states. And he said that as opposed to that time of everyday life, that it was a period of anti-structure. And so that what he did was oppose the idea that during life, during our everyday lives, we are kind of structured, but during these special liminal periods, there's this time of communitas. I think of this as the wedding party, that time afterward when people are all dancing around, everything's getting crazy, people are all happy and they're sleeping with each other and other people that they wouldn't have even talked to before and all of a sudden things are in transition. Um, and so what Victor Turner was arguing is that life is this kind of cycle and then as we go through various passages of of life, these rites of passage, we often encounter these moments where things get, get a little wild, but then we have to come back into structure as the new people. I found this diagram online, which might, uh, which kind of was a fun way to illustrate this. I think that you would start with the period of 
separation here. Here you're in the structure. The people are separated. They have their identity here. They get separated. You come down into this period of anti-structure and things get wild, times of liminality betwixt and between. People are getting together in communitas. Dogs are sleeping with cats, but then they have to come back into return into the structure as their new identity and a transformed person, but somebody always has to pick up after the party, as they say, and everyday life has to come back. So it's an interesting way to think about events that you may have been to as you're witnessing these things and different people's lives. College itself has a lot of these things. So we might think about different ceremonies that you have been to, like commencement, or some of you are coming up on graduation. So you're separated from your group. You have to put on funny clothes and the professors put on funny robes. And then, then you go into this period, hopefully during the, well, I don't know if the ceremony itself is that fun, but maybe there'll be a party afterward, a graduation party and everybody gets liminal. And then you have to go back into the world as an adult, unless you can escape off into graduate school and then you can, you know, keep this process going for a little bit longer, but you're coming into the world as a college graduate and you're now uh, supposed to get a job and have a real, real identity out there. In some ways, we might look at a class or even the period of classes this time at a time when the bell rings, you come out of your separated from your normal group. We talk to each other, the normal rules of life are suspended and then you go back and just be your normal self again. And we can also talk about the three or the four or the five years that you spend in college as itself this huge liminal period. So you're now separated from your family unit many times, you come to a different place, you're living with other people, the usual rules of life might be suspended, you might be trying some different things out, trying different identities out, and then of course you're going to have to come back into the structure as a person. So. I think what this does is it helps us understand or it helps us think about these both ceremonies, but also life passage events that we can, we can use as ways to illustrate this. So big points about religion and rituals, making the strange familiar, which is to say those things that we might call strange beliefs, they may have, if we look closer, more logic and consistency. So be very careful when somebody says ah, they're irrational or they're superstitious or they're backward or they're this. Just put that on hold for a second or just be careful whenever, whenever anybody says something else is irrational. You always have to think about, well, whose rationality are you dealing with? On the other side, think about how are the things that we do, what seems so familiar might be seen as or might, might be considered to be strange and that our practices may not be as rational as we consider them to be. This is not to say that, there, that we want to say everything goes and anything is fine and you can do whatever you want and it makes sense. No, but we want to make sure we understand things from within people's own frame of reference before we pass judgment. We may, though, at the end decide, oh, no, maybe that isn't the most rational thing I can do. Maybe I need to give up that custom. Doesn't make sense. And then as we just talked about using, being able to see life and to think about, oh, wow, I just went to this baptism and saw that, you know, how, how this worked, how, the, how people were all excited and went to this liminal period and then were reincorporated or re-aggregated in their new identities. So, Again, without going over all the facts and hitting you with a ton of information, I'm hoping these three principles 
about how to think about religion and the ritual lives and beliefs can, can help you out, can stick there a little bit as lessons. All right, enjoy the sunshine, have good weekends. We'll see you Tuesday. Thank you. Thanks.